right, y'all got your Bibles? Excited? You got it? There you go. All right. So we're going to dive into it today. Uh, we've got some folks that are kind of starting to come back a little bit. We've got some folks coming back into church. It's good to see some of you that we haven't seen in a while. It's nice to kind of be back in the, in the groove of things, and that's kind of cool. So um, for those of you that are at home, come back. We'd love to see you. We'd love to have you uh, join us. And uh, we've got snacks back in the back. We've also got hot chocolate. Uh, there, it's just Nice. Stick around afterwards and chat a little bit. Here's what we've been doing, though. We've been studying the book of Hebrews, and in the book of Hebrews, we, we've gone through all these things that are Jewish institutions that now are being replaced by Jesus, okay? So if you had the idea, so if you throughout your life have believed this, that, that Judaism was its own religion— and that somehow Christianity just out of nowhere, out of some primordial ooze, just just came out of nowhere, you're wrong. That's not what happened. Christianity, or what I call following Christ, that is the extension. It is the fulfillment of all the stuff that we had in the Old Testament. So you'll find people that will say, well, I don't ever read the Old Testament because I'm a, I, I'm a Christian. Right? I don't read the Old Testament. That doesn't apply to me. It totally applies to you because, because all that Old Testament stuff is all pointing to Jesus. Right? It's not about rules. It looks like it's about rules. It looks like it's about law. It looks like it's about sacrifices. It looks like it's about a whole lot of stuff that it's not really about. Right? It's all pointing to all of a sudden you see Jesus and you're like, aha, now it makes sense. Now it makes sense. Now we understand it. And it's really brought together here in the book of Hebrews. And so Jews who have become Christians are now looking back at Judaism. Why? Because we got a bunch of Christians, all right? A bunch of people giving their life to Christ, just like you and me, just regular people who, who denied Judaism. They've walked away from Judaism. They can't go back to the synagogue. They can't go back to uh, the priests won't let them in. Right? They're not allowed to do, they can't do sacrifices. If they sin, they can't make a sacrifice. Their families won't talk to them anymore. Right? Their parents won't talk to them. They're, there's all kinds, of, it's all kinds of stuff. They're being persecuted in a major way. And they're on this other side, and they're Christians now, and they're thinking, man, it was a lot easier when we were Jewish. When, it, when we were Jewish, that was way easier because like, we, could, we didn't have these kind of troubles now. And so maybe, maybe it would be a good idea for me to, it would be better if I hadn't become a Christian and I had just stayed Jewish. You ever think that way? It's okay, you don't have to be embarrassed. Have you ever thought, you became a Christian, you're like, man, there were things I liked about not being a Christian and I wish kind of I could go back there. Some people feel that way. These Christians, especially when you're facing uh, frustration from, from being persecuted or you're facing ridicule or you're being, uh, uh, because you're a Christian, you're treated differently. Those things sometimes will make people say, man, I wish I had what I had back then. I didn't face that kind of struggle. And that's what they're facing here. These are Hebrew Christians that are on the verge of turning back and going back to their old ways. Just to ritual and sacrifices and stuff like that. And so we talked about the different things that are replaced. Finally, we got to the priesthood, all right? Because here's the problem. We've got, we got Christians, all people, we are steeped in sin, okay? What does that mean? That means that at your very core, within your molecules, between your heart and your gut, between your brain and your synapses, it is just full of sin. You are just a sinner, 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 and you are entrenched. You are dug in to sin, okay? And God is holy. He is set apart. He is good. And he is dug in in holiness. And see, how can these people get together? How can God and that sinful person be joined together at all? Well, you've got to have a mediator between the two. And that mediator is called a priest, right? The Jews had priests. But now they become Christians. And they're like, we ain't got no priests. They don't got any priests. And so they're like, well, we've got to go back to where the priests are. Judaism. We'll go back to the priests. And the argument is made here. No, 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 no. All that priesthood pointed to Jesus because Jesus is a better high priest. He's a better priest. He's the best priest. He's the ultimate priest. And you say, well, how could that be? How could Jesus be a priest? Because he's got one thing going against him. Anybody know what the problem Jesus has about him for being a priest? It's in the wrong family. He's in the wrong family. He's not, there were 12 tribes of Israel. One tribe was the priest 
tribe, right? That's the Levites, right? Jesus ain't from that family. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. And they're like, well, problem is Jesus ain't, can't be a priest because he's from the wrong tribe. They're going, no, Jesus is the high priest. No, he's wrong tribe, right? He's, he, he's, he's, uh, he's, he doesn't belong in that. So let's open up to Hebrews chapter 7 because the argument is going to be made that Jesus doesn't have to be from that tribe because Jesus is from a tribe that's better. He's from an order that's better. It's a more significant and greater priesthood than this Levitical family priesthood. It's one called Melchizedek. I like the name Melchizedek. Kind of sounds like a name of a transformer to me, like, uh, like Optimus Prime or something like that. And then you got Melchizedek. I, like, I kind of like, like the name. So Hebrews chapter, chapter 7, Cooper, you were almost Melchizedek, right? No? All right. It says, this Melchizedek, it's going to talk about this cat. This guy's an interesting cat. Watch this guy. It says, this Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the king's and blessed him, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. You're like, what does that mean? That's just like, whew. Right? And, and uh, like a chapter before, it was like, you guys, you guys aren't even trying to understand. You'll never understand what I'm about to tell you because you're, you know, you, you, you're just weak in mind, right? You, you're not trying, right? And so you got to put on your thinking cap here, right? We have, to, we have to really think through this and really follow me. And I'm going to do my best to really explain this because it's pretty complex, all right? Here's what, here's what happens. It starts out by saying that Melchizedek was a king of Salem. There are three places where this cat Melchizedek is talked about in the Bible. The first is in the book of Genesis. And when it talks about him in the book of Genesis, that's the historical record of Melchizedek, right? So we, we see what actually happened in his life. Then we show up in Psalm 110 verse 4, and there is a section that talks about the guy Melchizedek in reference to Jesus, and that's prophetic. So you got historical, then you got prophetic, and then you show up to this section here in Hebrews, the last time it talks about him, and that is theological. It's theological. So it takes history, prophesies about that history, and then it gives you the, the theology of what this history and prophecy meant right here. So we're going to talk about that. In order to do it, we got to really go back, though, to the historical story. So that's in Genesis chapter 14. So turn back to Genesis uh, 14. Is it 14? Yeah, it's 14. And here's the, here, I'll give you a little intro as to what happened. So what begins is uh, Abraham has kind of an idiot nephew named Lot. All right, I don't know any nice way to say it. And he, he goes off and he does his own thing. He goes to a very evil place, Sodom and Gomorrah. And while he's there, while he's there, Sodom and Gomorrah, they get in a scuffle with some other kings. So there are like five kings against four, and there's this battle. And bottom line, uh, Ketelamar is one of the kings with his followers. They beat up and take the lunch money and everything else of this guy, of all the Sodomites. So the Sodomites and the other armies that are with them, lots of people, they get defeated by this, these armies and they get taken captive. All right? And one of the guys that's taken captive is Abraham's idiot nephew, Lot. Okay? And he's taken, his family's taken, all of his household's taken, all of his stuff is taken. Uh, the king of Sodom, he's taken. Everybody in Sodom is taken captive and all their stuff's taken. And you're like, great. Some dude in that thing gets away from the battle and comes and finds Abraham and says, hey, you know what? They took over Sodom and your nephew is one of them that got taken. And Abraham doesn't think kindly of that. He kind of saddles up, right? I mean, he's an old guy at this point. He's like, what, 80-something years older? And he saddles up on his horse and he's just like ready to go. He's fired up and he gets his own army of 318 guys that are in his own household. These aren't his kids, because he hasn't had any kids yet, but they're in his own household, and he goes up with 318 dudes against like thousands of officially trained armies, multiple armies, right? Unified armies. And he goes up against these guys, 318 dudes, their leaders like an old man, and they go up in battle, and he just routes them. It just beats the snot out of these guys. It's incredible. Watch this. In Genesis 14, it's a really cool story. It says, uh, verse 13, a man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now Abram 
was living near the great trees of Mamre the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abraham. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. So he starts chasing them down. This is hilarious. I think this is hilarious. You know, you've got this old guy that it, it's just like chasing them down, right? And he's only got 318 dudes with him. And they're, they're his buddies, right? And they, they, go, they go nuts. During the night, Abraham... Uh, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Ketelamar and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shiva. All right, so he routes these guys. He has this great victory. You've got all these people, all these Sodomite people, Sodomite women, Sodomite kids, and they're all looking at Abram. Woohoo! Way to go, Abram! You're awesome, man. You're the you're the boss, right? You're the guy. I mean, they're just like they're praising him. He's like the king of the world, right? Everybody thinks he's great because he's freed all these people. And then the king of Sodom, who was a slave, comes out and he's going to talk to Abram. But before he does, a priest shows up out of nowhere. And you're like, priest? This is Genesis. There's no priests yet. There's no Levites. There's no law yet. Right? Before there's any law, before there's any priesthood, a priest shows up out of nowhere right before a conversation with the Sodomite king. And he has a conversation with him. Look at this. This is really interesting. And this is why this is used in Hebrews. Then, so he comes out to meet him. at Verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem brought out bread and wine. Where, where, where do you see bread and wine at? Bread and wine, that looks like communion, doesn't it? Right? This is in Genesis 14, and out of nowhere, all of a sudden, this priest comes out, and he's got bread and wine, and he's the king of Salem. What is Salem? That is Jerusalem before it was Jerusalem, New Salem. So the king of Jerusalem comes out of nowhere with bread and wine and serves it to Abraham, who's just won this great battle. Then it says, and bless, he blessed Abraham. Now Abraham had just blessed all the Sodomites and all the people that had been killed captive, didn't he? He blessed them. Now somebody who is greater than Abraham blesses Abraham. He blesses, and watch what he does. It says, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. So I'm blessing you, Abraham. I'm, I'm giving you my blessing. And the blessing is by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. That's the God that this guy is a priest of, the God of heaven and earth. And praise be to God most high, praise also to God, why? Who delivered your enemies into your hand. This is, this is great. Watch what happens. A priest shows up just as the king of Sodom is about to show up, and he says, Abraham, I'm the king and the priest of, of, of Jerusalem, and you didn't win this battle. Everybody's telling you how great you are. Hey, look at this guy. With, with his army, he went and he defeated all these, and he, God won that victory for you. You did not win that victory. The spoils, all the people that are freed, that's God did that. All the people, all the goods that were recovered that had been stolen, they're all back in the hands of the people they belong to. God did that. You didn't do that. God did that. And Abraham recognizes before he talks to the king of Sodom, oh my goodness, God did that. God was with me. God provided that. God is the one who has blessed me with everything that I've received, everything that has happened. And so what does he do? Then Abraham gave a tenth of everything. He tithed. Out of nowhere, he tithed. Like he recognizes this guy as a priest, and then out of nowhere, he gives him a tenth of everything that he recovered. Has there been any law that said you should give 10% yet? No. There's not even any priests yet. There's nothing yet. And all of a sudden, this cat shows up out of nowhere with bread and wine, and, and he says, God did this. God provided. He's the king of Salem. He's also the priest. And it's just out of nowhere. This is incredible. But Abram said to the, so then Abram gave a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, so now the king of Sodom wants to talk. 
And he says, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself, right? All of a sudden, he thinks he's got bargaining power. All of a sudden, he thinks that he can, he can give, he can give, and that somehow he's going to provide for Abraham, right? Abraham just learned one verse earlier that you don't provide nothing for me. Everything that I have comes from God. God delivered all these. God gave all this stuff. I'm not taking it from you. It's not yours. God gave all this back. And so Abraham has a great response. He says, but Abraham said to the king of Sodom, with raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord God most high. He uses the same name for God, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten, the share that belongs to the men who went there, to Anner, Ashkal, and Mamre. Let them have their share. In other words, you don't get to define. You don't get to define where I receive. You don't get to, to tell the story about me. The story about me is that God is my provider. God has given me everything. That's the story, right? I'm not going to allow you to set up your own narrative that says that, oh, the only reason that guy's rich or the only reason that guy's blessed is because I blessed him. No, that, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. No, God blessed me. My story, this is my story, this is my song, God has provided, and I am responding in an appropriate way to the way God has blessed me. Okay? That's the story, historically, of Melchizedek. He shows up out of nowhere. And here's the weird thing. Genesis is one of the weirdest books about, about genealogies and numbers and who's begot so-and-so. And, you know, so when you, when you read about Moses, you know who his mom was. You know who his dad was. You know how long he lived. You know what he did. You know when he died. You know who buried him, which was God, by the way. You know about Aaron. You know about when he was born. You know, you know the stuff. So-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so. He lived this many years, had this son and daughter, and then he died, right? It's all laid out because Genesis cares about genealogy. It cares about where you came from and where you went, how you were born, how you died, and here's what happens. Melchizedek shows up, and you got none of it. This is an important guy. He blessed Abraham, and there's no mention of birth. We don't know who his mommy is. We don't know who his daddy is. We don't know when he died, if he died, was he born, was he not. We don't know nothing. And out of absence of any discussion of that, the Hebrew writer in the book of Hebrews is going to take that to help us understand it. Does that mean that, that Melchizedek didn't have no mommy and daddy? No, Melchizedek had a mommy and daddy. Does it mean he never died? No, he, he died, right? But the story, out of the absence of that in the historical record, what's going to happen is the writer of Hebrews is going to take that and going to say, no, that is left absent on purpose to show you the kind of priest that Jesus is because Jesus is a priest that has no beginning. Jesus is a priest that has no end. Right? Jesus is a priest, not like the Levitical priests that are born and we know who their daddy was. It had to be a Levite. And then he, you know, we know exactly that. We don't know that about this guy. This guy comes out of nowhere and he predates the Levitical priesthood. So it's a priesthood that's not just from the time God establishes the priesthood until now we don't have any priests. It goes on forever. The priesthood of Melchizedek goes on forever. Let's go back to Hebrews. Let's, let's dive into this and see if we can't make some forward progress here. All right. So Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 7. It says, This Melchizedek was king of Salem, the priest of God Most High. That's a big deal. You know why that's a big deal? Because the priests and kings in the, in the Bible, in Judaism, they don't go together. They don't go together. You can't be a king and a priest at the same time. That's a major no-no in the Bible, right? So there are occasions in the Bible where you'll have somebody that's the king, right? Like Saul, or you'll have Uzziah. There, there are times when the king will decide, I'm going to do priestly stuff. I'm going to go in and light incense. There's one instance early in the Bible where uh, the people go... People are gathered, and they don't understand why only Aaron and his kids can be lighting the incense, right? And so they go, we can do it on our own. Well, there's this kind of battle that goes on with them, with God, and God says, get away. And the ground opens up and eats the people that, that want to do the duty that's not rightfully theirs to do, right? There's another one. It's in Second Chronicles. Uh, look at 
uh, 2 Chronicles 26. I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but this will help you understand this. In 2 Chronicles 26, and i got to find kings and jump on over. Is it 26? I believe it's 26. Yeah, verse, uh, verse 16. But Uzziah, so Uzziah was a king of Israel, and he was a good king. He was a good, he was a good king, really good king. He followed God. He led the people to love God and that. But here's what happens. It says, then all the people, uh, no, but after Uzziah became powerful, right? When God, when you do what God wants you to do, God raises you up. God blesses you and you become powerful. And, and it says after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord followed him in they confronted King Uzziah and said it's not right for you Uzziah to burn incense to the Lord that is for the priests the descendants of Aaron who have been consecrated to burn incense leave the sanctuary for you have been unfaithful and you will not be honored by the Lord God this is a big deal right Uh, the, the king of the whole country goes in there and 80 priests courageous priests are willing to go in and confront this guy and said listen you cannot be in here dude You're the king, and kings and priests are separate. You're not consecrated to do priestly things. God is not going to be happy. Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand ready to burn incense, became angry. While he was raging at the priests in the presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Then Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him. They saw that he had leprosy on his forehead, so they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house. He was banned from the temple. I mean, it's big deal, right? So priests and kings, kings were never priests, okay? They were never, ever priests. It was a really big deal that they were kept separate. It was rigorously kept separate. But all of a sudden, we have this king jesus and this king and they always knew this and i don't think people really were making the connection about melchizedek right they never really thought about melchizedek right the fact that he was a priest and a king because they never thought of that really as a priesthood right they never really thought of that as a priesthood established priesthood they were like well no the real priesthood is the levites that's us what we had what god's given us and so it goes on let's let's keep going let's dive into this see if we can't make some heads or tails of this It says, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Okay, so the word Melchizedek, that means king of righteousness. The second thing, it says, uh, then also king of Salem means king of peace. That's actually in order because righteousness comes before peace. If you want peace, you have to have righteousness first. Okay, so they come in order and it says, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the son of God, he remains a priest forever. So there are some people who have said that this guy, Melchizedek, really is Jesus. He was the pre-incarnate Jesus. Don't think so. I don't think so. Because it says right here, it says that he is like the son of, like the son of God. It doesn't say that he was. Like, people don't come up to me, boy, you resemble Dustin Largent. They don't say that, right? That you are Dustin Largent, right? If this was Jesus, it would say he was Jesus, right? It's just a matter of just reading what it says. It says that. So it says, just think how great he was. How great who was? Melchizedek. How great was this guy? Now we're going to find out why he is so great, why they think he is so great. It says, just think how great he was, even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they also are descendants from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descendant from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. All right, so... Abraham, on a list of the greatest Jews of all time, where do you put Abraham? Way up high, right? He's the father of the entire Jewish faith, all right? And it says that Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, okay? He tithed to Melchizedek, right? He gave, so it must be a legitimate priesthood, first of all, if he's tithing to it. But here's the other part. Watch this. Watch this. The Levites, they are tithing 
to our, the, the tribes of Israel, they're tithing to the Levites. Or in other words, the people are giving to the church. Okay, that would be an equivalent way to say it. Because they're told to because of the law. Right, the law says, you Israelites, you have to give a tenth of everything you have to this particular tribe. That's what the law said. That's why they're doing it. Abraham shows up, there's no law, there's no anything, and he shows up and he gives a tenth to this guy, Melchizedek, and who's greater, Levi or Abraham? Abraham is way greater. You think, well, that's interesting. It goes on and it says, and without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. You know that's true? At least that's the way it's stated. So let's say, let's say you're going down the road, you're driving down the road, and you see a guy who needs help, right? And you stop and you help that person. You say, here, I'm going to give you food, and I'm going to give you a place to stay. It would be considered that the person who is helping the person is, in a sense, greater or has more, is able to provide better for the person who's receiving, okay? And so when Abraham... And that, that's not to say that they're not as valued or they're not as important. That's not it at all. They're talking about the greater blessing. One that blesses, the one that blesses is greater than the one who's being blessed. So what happens is Abraham, he frees all these sodomites, right? He goes into war and he frees them. And when he does, Abraham is greater than the sodomites, isn't he? He's greater than them. He's greater because he's the one who blessed them, right? He blessed them. He looked down and said, yes, I bless you. I free you. Then what happens? Abraham is then blessed by somebody else who's greater than him. Abraham, right here, who's blessed all these people, is blessed by Melchizedek, who speaks blessing upon him. Okay? It says here, the greater, look, look at this. It says, it says, this man, however, did not trace his descendant from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham, blessed him who had the promises, and without a doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater, right? So that means Melchizedek is greater or more important even. He's greater than Abraham. That's hard to handle. That there's a guy greater than Abraham. If you're a Jew, this is saying Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. It says in one case, the tenth is collected by people who die. So when you, uh, when you tithe or when you give um, like when they would give to the Levites, that Levite person eventually would have a heart attack and die. Or he would get run over by a camel or something, right? And he would die, right? It would come to an end. But when you give to the Melchizedek priesthood, when they would give, when he, Abraham gave to Melchizedek, he was given to a priest who has no beginning or end. That's the point he's trying to make. That he's, it's an ongoing forever type of, type of priesthood. In the one case, the tenth was collected by people who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Wow, this is some serious theology. You're going to love this one. All right, so here's what this is saying. This is what this is saying. This is, this is great. All right, so Abraham ended up tithing to Melchizedek. Okay? Levi is a descendant of Abraham, right? Abraham had Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob had Levi, right? What this is saying, and this is the thought in Judaism, is that, is that Levi was there with Abraham when he tithed. He was in his loins. Levi was in there somewhere. He was in the loins of Abraham, and so when Abraham tithed, Levi did too. Levi did too. So here, here, here's Case in point, uh, when I was uh, 18, I went parasailing one time. And when I was up in the thing, the boat ran out of gas, and I went into the water, and it was the dark water, and I thought I was going to drown, and it was a bad deal, and then the boats weren't running, and it was a nightmare. That happened to Cooper. You say, how did that happen to Cooper? Because I was 18, and I had not yet had Cooper. Cooper was still within my loins, right? And eventually he would be born because he was within me still, not yet procreated, he also parasailed and fell into the ocean. That's the idea that, that they have. And that's the reason why they say this. That's also the reason why when you say, you say, well, how's come I'm a sinner? I didn't sin. Adam sinned. Why am I accused of Adam's sin? 
because you were in the loins of Adam when Adam sinned. Every person on earth was in the loins of Adam when he committed sin. So everyone that came after had committed sin. Okay, It's the same concept. It's a Jewish concept of how this whole thing works. Anyway, this is great. So it goes on. Here we go. It says, if perfection, look at verse 11. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood. What is perfection? Perfection is is always, 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 always in the Bible, always, always means salvation. When it says perfection, that means you are saved, salvation. So it's, you can read it this way. It says, if salvation could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, you Jews that are wanting to go back to Judaism, if you could have had salvation through doing all your Levi, or doing all your sacrifices and all that kind of stuff, if it could have happened, and indeed, the law given to the people established that priesthood. The law said that that's the way the priesthood should be. Why was there need for another priest to come in the order of Melchizedek? Answer me that. You Jews that want to go, that want to go back, you Christians that want to go back to Judaism, why, why do we have a new priest? Why do we have Jesus in the order of Melchizedek if that one worked? If that one could provide you salvation, why didn't we just stay with that one? We didn't because it couldn't do its job. It couldn't accomplish what we needed. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron, or in the order of Le Levi, or that? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. See, the priesthood is changed now. We don't have the Levitical priesthood. All the priesthood stuff that you saw in the Old Testament, it's all gone. It doesn't exist. We don't need it. It's gone. Why? Because we have a new priesthood. You say, but that was in the law. Well, then change the law. The law has changed. And God can do it because he's God. It goes on. It says, he of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses never said anything about priests. In other words, Jesus never came from the Levite priesthood. So how could the guy be a priest? Right? He can't be a priest. He's from the wrong tribe. And Moses never said anything about that. And what, what we have said is even more clear. If another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry. So he's not a priest based on who his mommy and daddy were, that he was a Levite. But on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. His priesthood isn't based on genealogy. It's not based on that. It, that's law. That's, that's law. That's, that's earthly. Right? This guy's priesthood, this guy Melchizedek, Jesus his priesthood is based on this, that he never ends. You can never, never, never destroy him. You can't do anything to stop this priesthood. It goes on forever. Is the Levitical priesthood going forever? They're not even doing, there's no Levitical priesthood now. Go over there and try to make a sacrifice. There's, you can't. Go, go, go over to Israel, try to make a sacrifice in the temple. You can't. There's no Levitical priesthood. They're not sacrificing anything. Why? Because it's done. It's done. You can't do it. Why is it done? Because there's a better priesthood, and it's not a priesthood that starts and then it stops. It's a priesthood that goes on forever. Watch. It keeps going. An indestructible life. Verse 17. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Bible says in Psalm 110, verse 4, that Jesus will be a priest forever. Not just for a little bit of his lifetime, not for 80 years, but forever he will be a priest and it will be in the order of Melchizedek without beginning and without end. It goes on and on and on and on. Which is better. That's way better. Why would you want to go back to a priesthood where all your priests are dead? My priest isn't dead. He's alive. And he'll continue to be alive forever and ever and ever. Continuing to make intercession for me forever and ever and ever. 
Continuing to hear my prayers forever and ever and ever? Continuing to have a sacrifice that atones for everything I've ever done or ever thought that was wrong? It, it atones for me once forever and ever and ever? And you want to go back to this junk? Where you sacrifice a bull? And, and like three seconds later, you're still steeped in sin? And you're still, that doesn't make any sense. What's wrong with you guys? What's wrong with you Hebrews? What's the matter with you? Verse 18, the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. Why is, why is the Old Testament priesthood, why is it not there anymore? It tells you right here, because it was weak, right? It couldn't do what it was supposed to do, and it was useless. God created a priesthood that was useless. Okay, you say, why would he do that? He created a priesthood that was useless, not useless in the sense that, that it didn't have purpose in leading us to Jesus, but it was useless in the fact that it couldn't take away sin. It could just cover sin. It couldn't take away your sin. It couldn't save you. Salvation was by looking at those sacrifices in the Old Testament, looking at those and say, they point to the ultimate real sacrifice that's going to come, a person who's going to be, we know as Jesus. So it says, the former regulation is set aside because it was weak, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God, and it was not without an oath. Others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Okay, so here, I know this is a lot, but we're, we're getting it, and I'll be done in a few minutes, all right? So don't, don't run out on me yet. Oaths are important, okay? You talked about swearing last week. Right? I, I did listen, by the way. It was good. He talked about swearing, about the oath, right? So help me me, right? He talked about George Burns. And the whole deal is this, that in the Old Testament, when, when the, the promises were made to Abraham, they were made with an oath. God made an oath. When God makes an oath, you pretty much got that in the bag, right? You, you don't have any doubt that it's going to happen, right? So like if I was to go back in time right now to 2016, I know what happened in 2016. So I would bet everything, I'd mortgage my house, I'd sell it all, and I'd bet on the Cubs, right? Because I know what the outcome's gonna be. There's no doubt about what's going to happen, right? When God makes an oath, we know exactly what's going to happen. This is the case. Right? He made an oath about Abraham. He said, Abraham, you're going to have descendants that are as numerous as the stars in the sky. Right? Um, you're going to have a bit. It's as though it already happened once God makes a promise. When God made a promise, he made a promise about Jesus, about him being a priest. He said he will be a priest forever. And he made that with an oath. It was a promise from God. So help me me, according to God, right? What about, the, what about the Levites? Did he ever make a, a promise, an oath with the Levite? He never made any oath. He never said, oh, the Levitical priesthood will be forever. God never said that. God never, God never made an oath. So help me, me, this will be an everlasting priesthood. He never, ever said that. And he's pointing out to these Hebrews, he never said that. God only made a few oaths. When he made oaths, they were forever. He made an oath about Abraham he made an oath uh, when, when we had the, uh, uh, the ark, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not, you're not going to drown today, right, from a worldwide flood. Um, he, makes a, uh, he makes an oath here. He says, hey, he's a priest forever. And it says, and it was not without an oath. Uh, let's go down to verse 22. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Right? I can bet on the Cubs and know I'm guaranteed that money because it's going to happen because it was an oath. Right? It's an oath. It's guaranteed. He's the guarantor of a better covenant. Now, we'll finish up. There have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Right? In other words, a lot of those other priests, they all, they all died. They all died. And so you had all kinds of priests. You had thousands of priests. And they were all doing, you only need one priest if he lives forever. And he gets the job done. And this is what we know about our priest here. It says this. It says, such a high priest truly meets our need. Isn't that what we care about? Does it get the job done? Right? You hire somebody. You, you really don't care about anything if, except does he get the job done? Right? Is this person going to get the job done? D does he know how to do it? Is he does a good job? Right? 
If you hire somebody to, if you hire somebody to work at McDonald's and they, and they can't do any of the stuff, right, or they can't even show up, right, you're like, well, we can't hire you because you don't accomplish what you're supposed to. Right here, it's really clear. It says, now there, it says, now there has been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood, therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, he's blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. All right, really quick, let's run through this. Were any of the, Levit were any of the Levitical priests holy? No. No. They weren't holy. Not, not compared to God, they weren't holy. No, they weren't holy at all. Uh, it says they were blameless. Were they blameless? No. When they would make a sacrifice, they'd have to make a sacrifice for their own sin and say, oh, God, forgive me for my sin because I'm a nightmare already before they would do anything priestly. So no, they weren't that either. Were they pure? Eh, swing and a miss. Set apart from sinners? No. Swing and a miss. They were sinners just like everybody else. Finally, exalted above the heavens. Really? No. Swing and a miss. Right? These, this wasn't a good priesthood. Such a high priest truly meets our needs. He has all these. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day after day after day after day. First, for his own sins. Then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed, this is what Jesus did. He sacrificed one time, once for all, it says, when he offered himself, he was not only the priest, but he was also the sacrifice. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. All right, so I'm going to run through these. You got your notes? There, I'll run through these real quick so we got them. This is just a quick review. We know that Levi, uh, Levi's, uh, priesthood, the, pre the priesthood of Levi, the Old Testament, that priesthood was temporary, but Melchizedek, priesthood of Jesus, was permanent, okay? It was permanent. The Levitical priesthood uh, was not. It was temporary. Um, we find also that Levi, Levi's priesthood, it was hereditary. It was based on who your daddy was, right? Whether you got to be in the family business, right, and be a, be a priest. And it was hereditary, and it was official. It was like this official kind of a job, right? Not the priesthood of Melchizedek and Jesus. It was uh, personal and it was eternal. It was personal and it was eternal. In verse 20 to 22, we saw that Levi's priesthood was without an oath. There was no oath associated with it, right? Melchizedek, Melchizedek's priesthood of Jesus was made uh, by an oath and therefore it was unchanging. It was promised. We knew beyond a shadow of a doubt this is the priesthood, in verse 23 to 25, we see that Levi, his priesthood, was a whole bunch of people in succession. <laughs> live, die, live, die, live, die, live, die, right? Melchizedek's priesthood of Jesus was one man enduring forever with an indestructible life. That's Jesus. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. I'll say this also, that neither Moses' law nor Aaron's sacrifice. This is the Old Testament in a nutshell. Take the whole Old Testament. You've got two things. You've got the law and you've got the sacrifices. The law is Moses. Sacrifices is Aaron. Neither of those two things could deliver the people from the wilderness of sin and bring them into the land of salvation. Aaron never enters into the, into the promised land. Moses never enters into the promised land. Why? You say, well, because they sin. Yeah, they, it's because they sin. But the reason, if you want to look at this realistically, why does Aaron, the priesthood, and why does Moses, why do they never get to go into the promised land? They never do. They die outside of the promised land. Why is that? Because neither the law nor the priesthood can lead people to salvation. The promised land represents salvation, and they never get into salvation. They never can get to salvation. Because that doesn't, that's not a good enough priesthood. That's all pointing to a better priesthood, Melchizedek, who is Jesus. And Jesus will lead you without a shadow of a doubt, without any question, comment, wisecrack, anything. He leads you into salvation. Jesus is the one that leads us into the promised land. Not Aaron, not Levi, or not Moses, 
okay? <laughs> okay, how great is Jesus? That was the main point. How great is Jesus? Well, he looks really great when you compare him to these, this priesthood over here. Looks like, jeez, man, wh who, who came up with this thing, man? It can't even do its job. People are dying all the time, right? Aaron dies, and they, they take him up on a mountain, and they take his, before he dies, they take off his priestly garments, because once you're, when you're dead, your priesthood's over. They take him up a mountain, take off his garments, give it to his son. All right, now you're the priest. All right, and then he dies. It's a great story, right? really uplifting. Anyway, um, let's, uh, we'll continue on. We'll keep going, but anyway, I appreciate you coming and joining us this morning and diving into Melchizedek. I know it's heavy stuff. It's pretty heavy, pretty heavy. Melchizedek. But if, you, if any of you are out there and you're watching and you're having a kid, uh, name that kid Melchizedek. I like that name. So uh, if you, give him, if you uh, name him Melchizedek, bring the kid in. I'll be sure to buy him a onesie that says uh, high priest on him. So, all right. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, pray and, and then we'll be dismissed today. God, thanks for uh, bringing us here and uh, being able to study Melchizedek. That's a mouthful, just a lot of stuff with him, God. But but uh, we're, not, we're not excited about Melchizedek. We're excited about Jesus. Melchizedek is so great, and yet he's nothing compared to Jesus. Melchizedek, all he does is point to Jesus. He's greater than Abraham, and the best he does is point to Jesus. That's how great Jesus is. God, we, we, man, it's such an honor to be your child. It's such an honor to be uh, a part of your family. God, thank you. And, and we do say that you are great, God. You are great, in Jesus' name.